So I would like to welcome everyone very warmly and thank you for joining us today in a, a very busy day as we celebrate and commemorate International Women's Day. I am Jennifer G. I'm the gender team leader from the Fisheries Division. And today I will be guiding us through this webinar. I would like to note for all of you that this event will be recorded and available later for viewing. Right now, all participants have been muted and the video is shut off. And we ask you to please use the chat box feature with any questions or points you'd like to raise so we are able to come back to you after the webinar, since our time is too short today to take live questions. Dear participants, panelists and colleagues, I have the really great honor of introducing the FAO Deputy Director General, Maria Elena Semedo, for the opening and welcoming remarks. Ms. Semedo, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and uh, esteemed panelists, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear sisters. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on this International Women's Day, and especially to celebrate women in leadership in the fisheries and aquaculture sector. To me particularly, today's event has special significance, and I go back in 1991, when I started in Cabo Verde as Minister, Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries and later on Minister for Fisheries, Agriculture and Rural Affairs. And I stayed 10 years taking care of fisheries. And I also want to share with you that I was the first women minister uh, in my country. And during this period, I have always observed with admiration how women take on their shoulders, waiting long hours at the beaches for the fishing boats to arrive. They collect fish, clean, process, and sell, adding up to all other chores they had already performed at home. And women's first goal of achieving food self-sufficiency and improving the living conditions of their families and communities have always been a wonder for me. And I know firsthand that women in fisheries and aquaculture face gender-based constraints, not only in assessing resources, services, technologies, training, education, financial assets, credits, and institutions, but also in contributing to decision-making processes and attaining leadership position. Women make up 50% of the workforce in fisheries and aquaculture, especially in small scale operations. Yet, they remain largely invisible in the industry and their work is often unrecognized and always underestimated. And because of the informality of their status, women also have less access to social protection programs, making them even more vulnerable. We need to increase our efforts to make women and girls contribution to fisheries and aquaculture more visible and valued. It is crucial to work together to remove gender-based barriers that limit women's empowerment and their capacity to reach their full potential. And this is fundamental for fisheries and aquaculture to be sustainable, as was recognized in the recently adopted COFI Declaration on Sustainable Fisheries and Aquaculture. A recent study of top level seafood management published by the International Organization for Women in Seafood Industry, who are here today with us, reveals that only 40% of top positions are held by women. And when you go to the CU level, only 4% are women. This is unacceptable. This is must change. The academics, professional and activists advocating for an increased recognition of women's rights in fisheries are for the most part women. We need men to step up and be allies with women and girls. 
Indeed, this message was carried in the year of May allyship campaign launched by the United Nations, he for she movement. An ally can be someone who amplifies women's voice, who educates themselves about different identities and experience. Someone who challenge the status quo and someone who takes action. Bringing women to the negotiation and decision-making process is a non-negotiable element to be considered in fisheries and aquaculture. Fisheries and aquaculture development and management at local, national, or regional level. It is only by bringing everyone to the table and valuing women's experience, perspectives, and skills that women will be able to make game-changing contribution to decisions, policies, and laws. Today's impressive panelists bring a diverse range of roles, but are united by a common thread in holding rare position of leadership throughout the seafood sector. Indeed, COVID-19 response and recovery efforts clearly demonstrates the unique capacities, knowledge and networks of women in leadership. Through the sharing of experience, we'll hear strong examples of concrete and engaged action that can abolish the deeply anchored gender norms and highlight the significant role of women leaders in building a resilient, inclusive, and most important, equitable society. And this is the right thing to do. Again, I would like to thank everyone for your participation and engagement. Let's be together. Let's be united to build an equitable society. Only with an equitable society, society we can change the world. I wish you a very fruitful discussion and a happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tomato, for opening this webinar. It's a rare privilege to have one of the first female ministers sharing her perspectives with us. I open this webinar for International Women's Day with a reminder that the work for Women's Day should be an everyday occurrence of action towards gender equality and dismantling the patriarchy. We are bringing you four panelists who are leaders in the seafood sectors and have a format where we invite them to speak and share their reflections. This webinar is designed to not only create space and amplify their voices, but also to forge strong partnerships and alliances in order to build future work. We aim to develop concrete actions with our partners and stakeholders, many of whom have already been active for decades in the fight for gender equality. We invite you to follow their discussions in this webinar, which is intended as a step forward engaging towards gender equality, not as a box ticking exercise. The theme of this year's International Women's Day is women in leadership, and this theme is accompanied by a call to action made with the hashtag choose to challenge to call out gender bias and inequality. We welcome the challenges to the status quo brought by our panelists today, both through their career choices, but also by the challenges they will raise to us and the broader community. We now have the pleasure of beginning with the panelists' presentations with Shirlene Anthony Salmon, and she's the director of InfoFish. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, thank you. And uh, it was a very um, nice message that we heard from uh, Mr. Semedo just now. I uh, also like to take this opportunity to thank um, FAO for inviting InfoFish to be part of this very important uh, event. Um, so I'll just give you a, a brief about InfoFish. Uh, we are an intergovernmental organization uh, which was set up by FAO in 1981 as a project and our main mandate is to provide marketing information and technical advisory services for the industry in the Asia-Pacific region 
and beyond. We currently have 12 member countries, uh, mostly from the Asia Pacific region. And um, we have been working with them, uh, providing them with uh, supporting the industry with uh, fisheries developmental services and activities. And these are mainly through training programs that we organize, consultancy that, uh, or rather project activities that we get through international funding. Uh, we are a um, integral part of the whole fisheries industry in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, we actually play a very important role in providing up-to-date market information, uh, export promotion activities for the region as well. Uh, we provide or uh, disseminate this information, technical information, marketing information through our publications. Uh, I think many in the, in the industry are familiar with the InfoFish International, the InfoFish Trade News through which we publish uh, up-to-date uh, uh, trade information and also industry-related information. Um, since the establishment of InfoFish, we've uh, trained more than 6,000 people in the industry in fish handling, in processing, um, also in quality control, HACCP, including trade and marketing as well. And um, we uh, actually, uh, you can uh, sort of call us a one-stop technical and uh, marketing information center for the industry in, uh, in the region. We are also actually the regional body of FAO's uh, Global Fisheries Information Network uh, with regional office in uh, the, the different regions um, globally. We have InfoPesca, InfoPesh, uh, InfoU, InfoSamak, and uh, Globefish, as well as Eurofish. Uh, so as uh, in my capacity as the director of InfoFish, I'm responsible for leading all the activities in this uh, in the region, uh, or rather the org organization's activities in the region, uh, for the benefit of mainly the InfoFish member countries, as well as uh, on, uh, in the region as a whole. Uh, promoting, of course, the sustainable use of fishery resources. Uh, InfoFish also strongly supports uh, issues on the global agenda, such as decent work in fisheries, women in fisheries, and social responsibility. Um, well, just to, to touch a little bit on, on some of the um, hurdles that um, in my career um, in terms of um, facing uh, issues related to gender. Uh, it's very much actually related to cultures in the Asia Pacific region, uh, which we can say is not really homogeneous. And in some countries, uh, we still have the mindset that uh, men make better leaders. Uh, of course, we have, we have come a long way from there, but we still have that a notion that, that is uh, still happens in this region, and that women are more naturally suited for softer, softer roles such as communications and so on. When when you give uh, uh, the uh, the choice between uh, two uh, professionals who have the same background but different on different gender, many in the region would still uh, choose the male. Um, I would say uh, one other factor is age in addition to gender. Um, and there's a prescription that either you're not old enough or you're not experienced enough. So these are some of the things that I've experienced uh, in my career since I've been in the fisheries. So you always have to push harder in order to instill the confidence in, in people. I must acknowledge here that um, I have had many women and male allies who have inspired me and supported me in my career, and I'm uh, fortunate in that sense. Uh, one other thing that has been uh, a hurdle in this, in my experience, is I would say make, maintaining an equitable gender balance uh, in our organization as well as in our activities. And uh, as we all know, in fisheries, uh, it's it's really hard to come by, um, or rather, it's it's uh, a challenge to have more women in the managerial or senior leadership roles. And so, the number of candidates who are, who choose to be or or we try to select in this in these um, roles are also um, correspondingly lower. So that's one of the things that uh, we experience uh, or rather experience. And one other factor that I can also mention is in relation to the cultural perceptions uh, in that uh, in the region, which is uh, women tend to be expected to be softer. 
uh, in terms of you know the way we speak, uh, in our mannerisms, and so on. But these are uh, these are attributes that uh, do not really translate, uh, especially when you are the managerial role, leadership position. So uh, we have to find ourselves to push ourselves to be uh, reach that sort of higher level of assertiveness. Without seemingly, uh, you know, without being seeming uh, aggressive, uh, there's there's this uh, perception that uh, aggression in men is probably uh, more readily uh, acceptable than in women. So, these are some of the things that uh, we find, uh, or rather, I I wouldn't say it's a big hurdle, but it's some of the the main challenges that we commonly come across. Uh, I I would say that these are not something that has been resolved. Uh, these issues are not something resolved. I don't think there's anything that's going to is at, at uh, a point that we have resolved it. It's an ongoing process. And I think we all have to keep pushing and uh, with consistent and persistent action. So it's a long going process that's, um, uh, that has not been re resolved. Uh, I must also add that we, we indeed have become, have come a long way. There's long uh, there's uh, there's a lot of um, improvement and we have moved uh, progressed greatly. But still, uh, you know, the journey is is never ending. Um, and these hurdles, I would say, uh, varies according to the region. It varies according. It can also vary according to countries and also different ethnicities. Uh, some countries might uh, be having, uh, you know, might be uh, take longer to solve. Some may face tougher situations. Some countries may may be even having more subtle uh, issues. So it, it's really quite uh, contrast. I, I I would not say that you can really generalize uh, when it comes to the types of, um, you know, which hurdles would remain uh, or rather remain longer. Uh, but mainly, I would say, due to social, cultural, and re religious norms, uh, we do see women in the Asia Pacific region, particularly in this region where we belong to, are still lacking a song, strong voice in terms of uh, making uh, decisions or commonly found or commonly found at uh, managerial roles. Uh, having said that, I, I must also add that in some of the countries in the Asia Pacific region, we do find women dominating uh, the workforce, particularly in the government, uh, in the government uh, role. Um, for example, like in the Philippines and Thailand, we do see many women, uh, a, a very strong presence of women in the, in the government sector and also holding managerial roles, which is really inspiring. And that really shows uh, how uh, important the, the role of women playing in the uh, government sector. Uh, but the challenge remains, however, that uh, you know we got to prove our capability. And this is a long process that uh, when we are faced with social cultural norms, it, it's something that we are trying to sort of undo. Uh, cultural norms, it's something that has been there for a long time. So when we are trying to undo this, it's definitely going to take time. But we have, again, uh, come in, in the, for a very long, you know, very long way. Uh, at InfoFish, we have been trying to uh, ensure that we have a gender balance in all our activities as much as possible. Uh, even our workforce currently uh, at InfoFish, we have uh, our our current status is almost eighty percent of us are women in InfoFish. Uh, we're trying to still uh, ensure that we have a, a, a balance. Uh, in our activities, we are trying to have a greater participation of women, and uh, particularly in our international events, conferences, our training programs, we are having more and more uh, women who come in as panelists, as moderators. Um, uh, at, at this point, I'd also like to add that uh, at our Pacific uh, webinar, uh, TUNA webinar that we had last November, for the first time, uh, I think, in the history of InfoFish, we had a lady uh, who delivered the keynote address. So that's a milestone in InfoFish, uh, and uh, I'd like to highlight and also thank Ms. Pamela Maru, who's the Secretary of the Ministry of Fisheries, Cook Islands, who, who gave us the honor to deliver the keynote. So um, we're doing step by step, we're moving, and we're trying to uh, make a difference in whichever possible way that we can. 
uh, also this is the first time that uh, we have uh, a lady who is in the uh, line of Infofish uh, uh, leaders since the establishment. And uh, that's the organizations and also the member countries' greatest achievement, I think. And it just goes to show how uh, important uh, that it's placed, the, the role of women is placed in, in Infofish member countries as well. Um, one of the things that uh, we would like to highlight about uh, young women who are willing to engage in the fisheries and aquaculture sector is, uh, uh, I think it's very important to create uh, women entrepreneurs in communities uh, across the region. Uh, if you look at the examples uh, highlighted by WSI in their video competitions, uh, you'll see that empowered women are, even in the marginalized com communities, can become real inspirations. Uh, for young women, and I think we can talk about this. Uh, we can still we can still say that this is a man's world, uh, but at the same time, if we do not do anything, uh, then it's always going to remain remain a man's world. Uh, and honestly, you you we don't know if uh, the daughters of these women in these videos that we are seeing, uh, who could be one day leaders themselves uh, in our industry. Uh, personally, I feel that. We don't actually realize that we are also inspiration for someone in this world or in this industry. I realized that even before uh, uh, landing in this position, uh, when I had uh, this lady and gentleman who came up to me once during one of our events, uh, training events, and said that they were really inspired to see a lady at this event. And this happened in, in one of the countries, in, in, in uh, InfoFish member countries. So, it's really uh, nice to hear when somebody comes up to you and says, so I think um, uh, we women have greater opportunities in this, in this uh, industry to become, uh, to make a difference, simply because there are less women in this, in this uh, industry. Uh, I think uh, also how we could, some of the ways on how we could actually uh, break these norms in the seafood sector uh, to have a little bit more or, or create that uh, direction to have more gender inequality. I think it's very important for the governments, the private sector, the NGOs, um, and also the legislative environments to work together. It's very important because this definitely uh, will be, uh, uh, bring a, a, a really uh, important change and a better impact. Um, if businesses and stakeholders take the responsibility to redress this issue uh, of imbalance in, in gender, we will definitely be seeing more, uh, more impact, uh, particularly uh, you know, by stakeholders providing, coming up to provide training, uh, in improving handling and processing, uh, even official, uh, giving them better access to markets, training, training them in um, how to access internet. Uh, E-commerce is becoming so important now, all the more with, uh, with this COVID-19 crisis, e-commerce has become so important and it's, and it's actually providing a very important uh, a potential um, outlet, I would say for women to uh, explore. Uh, uh, in terms of you know trying to uh, make their lives better, so uh, even training on how to access you know providing the access to internet and connectivity itself, considering some of some countries still have that challenge to have proper internet connection, so stakeholders can come in and, and try and provide this access to them, given uh, providing easier access and training as well on how to do e-commerce. So this is quite important. And I think all this is only achieved, uh, can only be achieved if we have that uh, really good uh, cooperation between these, all these three, uh, four components, I would say. And uh, to be honest, there's already been some significant progress in this region, Asia-Pacific region. We have uh, companies like Thai Union, who's already um, providing quite a bit for their, uh, their employees and women workers, and also providing childcare support. Uh, in collaboration with NGOs. So this is also very encouraging to, to hear, um, providing empowerment uh, for a women's group. And uh, for example, in, in Fiji, uh, we see a lot of this in, Fiji, uh, in the Pacific Islands. And for example, in Fiji, we have the Ministry of Fisheries who have been uh, working with 
the small um, business women business groups to provide them with support uh, in uh, developing their pearl business. So, Charlene, yes, I'm so sorry to interrupt. This is I'm so done. interesting, but <laughs> we have to ask you just to close down. Sure, sure, I'm done. Thanks, Jennifer. So sorry. sorry. No problem. No problem. Okay. As I've as I've interrupted you, I also wish to say thank you so much for the points um, and the discussion. And I think particularly this is an excellent consideration for the next topic is this um, work making sure that women are included and have access to these new um, new or not so new digital options to help improve gender equality. So thank you, Charlene. And we look forward to hearing more from you during the discussion. Thank you. Um, and I just make a note that Ms. Semedo had to leave. She has another event now for International Women's Day, but she passed on her best to everyone and wished a successful continuation of the webinar. Um, up next, we have two presenters from the International Organization for Women in the Seafood Industry, or WSI. And so we will be hearing from Christelle Vigo, the chairwoman of WSI, and Marie-Christine Montfort, who is the co-founder and executive director of WSI. So I pass the floor to them. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and, and good afternoon, uh, morning, evening for, to everyone. So WSI, the Women in the Seafood Industry Association, is a non-for-profit organization, works exclusively on the gender equality in the seafood industry. It is a SDG file, and we think that it's, it's, it's a good way to leverage uh, gender equality to, to achieve the other SDG. It has been created in 2016 by two seafood experts and two gender specialists who came to the point that gender inequalities in the seafood industries was, a very, was very high and very damageable to the people, the business, and the planet. So, as has been already said by the by the by Miss Semedo and the, and the first speaker, the women are not rare in the seafood industry because they count for fifty percent of the global workforce, but they are rare at the top position, as recalled by the Deputy Director General. Women represent less than fifteen percent of private companies' board members. They are rare in the professional organization, in the fisheries management organization as well as in regional fisheries program organization, public institution, or even in, in investor, in agricultural sector, and, and entrepreneur globally, and globally at the decision-making position. And this absence of or imbalance of uh, women at the leading position leads to very bad or not, we think not the best decision for businesses, organization, and environment. Why so few women women at the decision-making position. What we have, we, we have been observed and, and it is backed by uh, research and academic paper and, and, and surveys and all of our work, is that women do not enjoy equal condition and are slowed down when they carry out their work. Impediments to accessing inputs such as capital, bank loans, new technology and training, which are all necessary to climb the hierarchy. Stereotype and social norms. Do, do you hear me? Perfectly, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So stereotypes and social norms, as well as sometimes some laws in, in some country, prevent women from accesses to some jobs. For example, fisherwomen are not recognized as professional in many countries and cannot become members of professional organization. On top of that, the stereotype of women who need to carry the family burden lie disproportionately on the woman's shoulder where taking care of family members, where the parents or the kids is a time consuming and energy consuming activity and very costly, leaving fewer resources for women's own work. And the role as well of informal networks where the business is made, is not made in formal uh, process, but more in the informal process, the seafood industry originates from and maintains a patriarchal system where the rules are made by the men from the men. The patriarchal system is ingrained in the system itself. So in this industry, the informal setting, relationship, networks, flow of information, mentoring, and so on, where the career is made 
also favors men. Men have a far more active network. And at the end, it is to their advantage. Beyond, beyond the top leadership, what is important also is to acknowledge and recognize that there are true disc discrimination, crimes, and violence against women. Reports show that women who occupy 90% of all the jobs in the labor-intensive seafood processing industry commonly suffer discrimination, violence, sexual harassment, and poor working condition. And also, unconscious bias during recruitment. It has been proven hundreds of times that recruiters whether they are male or female, tend to favor male application. And before to, to pass the voice to Marie-Christine, WSI is here to advocate gender balance at all the level of, of the industry, including at the top level, because we think that absence of women is one of the cause of dramatic resource and non-sustainability management. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for organizing this, um, this meeting this afternoon or this morning or this evening, according to the place you're based in. Um, I'm Mar Christine Montfort. I am the director of uh, WSI, the uh, organization that Christelle just presented. And as she said, we now know that overlooking women is part of the reasons of the poor marine resource management in fisheries and in aquaculture. So really uh, overlooking and uh, uh, forgetting that women are really part of this industry is damageable to the industry. So WSI as an organization is embarked on a three-step voyage uh, where the first step will be raising awareness. The second step will be advocating for a better understanding. And the, th the third step will be inspiring practical changes. So I will uh, uh, go and present for you the different steps and then turn into some uh, uh, examples. As we have been working on this for a few years now, we understand that raising awareness is essential. In order to raise consciousness, the issue needs to be recognized. If you don't see the problems, how would you would like you to, to seek the solution? So in order to get the issues recognized at WSI, we, we count and we count and we count again. And for instance, the figure given by Mrs. Maria Elena Semedo um, come from a study that WSI run every year measuring the number of women sitting in boards of the hundred largest seafood companies. So count, count, count. This is our motto. We also advocate the creation of public and private statistics because what is not counted precisely doesn't count. And this is precisely the problem or one of the problem that women face in our industry. We also meet decision makers within private companies. We share with them our data, our understanding of gender gap and at, at all level of seafood enterprises. For instance, did you know that the seafood industry share with the mining industry, the gold medal for the lowest percentage of women sitting in boards. 13% for mining, 14% for seafood, and 17.17% for oil and gas. But the problem is even worse than what it seems, because in mining, for instance, the uh, uh, workforce um, um, gathers some 20% female workers when in seafood, this has been said by Mrs. Semedo, this has been said by uh, uh, Sherlin as well. In the seafood industry, 50% of the workers are women. So you see the gap, even with the mining industry. So all our actions highlight the gender gap, make the invisible visible. 
and raise the consciousness or try to raise the consciousness of leaders that their business is based on gender inequalities. Among our programs, we have created the video competition to which Yuki, that you will meet in a few moments, participate and won an award in 2020. Up to now, we have received nearly a hundred videos and note that 2021 contest is now open. So we are waiting for your testimony and for your stories. Um, we also compile all events that happen all over the world about women in the seafood industry, what they do, their success and their struggles. This document is a very useful tool to all who want to better understand what is at stake. I have the pleasure to announce that the watch this year um, 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 with the date of 20, uh, 2020 was launched a few hours ago. So you can get it for free on our website. It compiles some 250 stories from 55 countries. And I promise you, this document is really an eye opener. When we started meeting people, as we were developing WSI, it was common for men to tell us in a somehow compassionate voice, I understand, I understand you. I, I have one daughter, sometimes they said, I have even two daughters. But precisely in saying that, they were telling us that they understood little about the subject. We have to take this, this issue out of the personal sphere it is not a question of me, it is not a question of you, it is not a question about your daughters. It is a question, a question, an issue of gender balance, social and economic organization. We were also said that there were no more women at decision making level because they could not find candidates. In digging a bit, we understood that the lack of female candidates came partly from the problem of the industry. It is not very attractive precisely because it is totally dominated by men. And secondly, because heavy unconscious bias made recruiters choose male candidate, as Crystal said earlier. And this is quite obvious in the seafood industry, but not only, not only. If it were a country, um, I'm sorry to say that, but if it were a country, the seafood industry would be one of the most unequal country on the planet. So we at WSI are convinced that this industry in all its dimensions, that is social, environmental, economical, need gender transformative policies. And to get that, we need to have more women in high level decision making position. Women's leadership is key to make this industry more progressive, more attractive and more sustainable. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Marie Christine and Christelle for your presentations. And I would actually, if you have the link, you could share it in the chat with the participants so everyone can have a look. And as you may have noticed, we've been posting the speaker bios as we go. So we're trying to keep up with information for all of the participants to see. So up next, we have this video. Uh, this video was a finalist of the annual video competition hosted by WSI. It features Yuki Kyudi, and she will be speaking after the video. So we get to hear from her in person as well. But first of all, the video.私のお寿司屋さんは
お寿司が日本にとって重要なのは日本は周りがこう島で囲ま島国といって周りが海に囲まれているので昔は魚を食べることが主でしたし、まあ、今もそうですけれども魚中心の食生活とお米を食べている生活だったので魚と米がメインです日本の食事は。それを合わせたものが寿司なのでそしてそれにこうなんて言うんでしょうあの伝統を混ぜて発展させていったので日本の代表食といえば寿司ってみんな思っていることだと思います私のレストランで出す一番のそうですねお気に入りのおすすめのメニューは、えー、とそれぞれのお客様に合わせてお寿司を毎回作るその盛り付けて出されたお寿司とかそのお客様によって変えられる味付けとかトッピングとかで作るお寿司だと。私がお寿司を好きな理由はあのお寿司はとてもシンプルな形をしているんですけれどもその中にたくさんの工程とかその時に合わせてたくさんのこう仕込みとか過程があるんですね煮込んだりとかあとはこう昆布とかで味付けをしたりとかいろんな技法が詰められててそれを一つの,あの米と魚したあの形だけで集約して表すっていうのはなかなか他の料理にもないと思っていますねそしてあのシンプルな色例えば白と赤マグロの赤米の白の2色だけで構成されているのにあの素晴らしい芸術性を感じるというのはやっぱりそういう工程がいっぱいあるからだからお寿司の魅力だと思います今後女性寿司職人が増えるかというと私は今のままの体制だったら増えないと思います。でも増やすためには、えー、とまずは女性にとってやりやすいルールとか働きたいと思うような環境を作ってあげることだと思ってそれがなでしこ寿司なんですけれどもそれをもっと広めさせる私に責任があると思うので頑張れば増えると思いますしあと女性がこうリーダーになってどんどん寿司店をこういっぱいオープンさせるためには育児とか出産とかあとは介護とかそういうライフステージが女性には待っているのでそれを助けてあげられるような環境そうですね保育介護そういうい施設の充実今私がやっている取り組みはなでしこ寿司だけではなくてあの女性アーティスト日本でやっぱアートが売れないのでそういう女性アーティストとお寿司を新しくコラボレーションしてで、えー、と例えば先日だったらお皿を作るアーティストさんにそのうちの寿司のお皿を作ってそれに合わせた彼女はなでしこ寿司に合わせたお皿を作ってなでしこ寿司はその彼女に合わせたお寿司を作ってコラボレーションしてお客様に出していくっていうアートコラボレーションをしているんですねそんなような世界を作ることですね Thank you so much I'm sure you've all enjoyed this video as much as I have and、um... I think that Yuki, you'd better be ready for a lot of new customers as soon as we can travel.、Um, we now have the opportunity to hear directly from Yuki, and I would also like to introduce Makiko Saigawa, who will be translating for Yuki as needed. So, welcome to both of you. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, the internet was terminated. So it's just interception, but、uh, we, we,、um, we revive back again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> ね、amazing timing. <laughs>、okay. Sorry for this. Hi. Jamo. Okay. Speech, okay. okay. Are you okay? Speech. Yes, please go ahead. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. I'm Yuki Chizui and I'm a sushi chef in Japan. In fact, there is a very, very few sushi chefs in Japan, female sushi chefs. For next generation, as a female sushi chef, I am a pioneer of a new sushi industry. I've been working as a managing director of a sushi restaurant called Nadeshiko Sushi. In Akihabara, Tokyo, Japan, for over 10 years. In fact, I'm the first female managing director running a sushi restaurant 
who also does sushi supervisor and uh, sushi making too. Also, I'm uh, heading a sushi school as a founder, principal, and lecturer there. Since last year, I've extended my business territories by establishing Next Generation Sushi Association. Based on my experience in this Next Generation Sushi Association, I launched a new incorporate company, BKTC. I am CEO. Next Generation Sushi Association provides a course of education and nourishment with an eye for mainly three goals to promote the freestyle sushi out of the box, to grow the expansion, a new permanent job, and professional choice for women and for the benefit of the children in future. In reality, the world of the chef is a completely male supremacy in Japan. Despite the challenge, my dream is make the job so chef as an aspired occupation among women. Also, to help people around the world eat sushi not as a gastronomy, but as a daily healthy diet. And I find these goals are my important mission to carry. For this goal, I'm I putting all my heart and energy into my new businesses. Among them, I'm committing the most to medical herb fishery yakuzen salmon. What is a yakuzen salmon? I mean medical herbs fish. I blend the feed of medical herbs. I blend using natural organic herbs to fish. Then I nourish my fish with this special feed of medical herbs at a safe environment with rich green nature. I branding my fish for special fired fish, health uses or functional food for this business. I'm setting a goal to farm them as a sustainable business, harmonize it with environment, nature, community, health and longevity. I believe it is a world first attempt it is unprecedented the challenge that the sous chef, if a women's sous chef invented, I want to promote fishery diet in a wide variety of forms and styles to eaters around the world. Therefore, it is extremely important that I will use a special, special ingredient to of fish which I commit myself so much. From now on, I'd like to encourage a presence of women at the fishery industry. For this, I'd like to get along with more people around the world. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Yuki. We appreciate very much you sharing this news with us as well of the um, pioneering work you've already been doing. So we move now to the discussion point. We're um, very happy to hear again from our panelists. And so we'll begin by sharing the screen to show the questions. Sorry, just one little minute as we shift gears for the question sharing. Okay, so you'll have to trust me. This is what was written in the question. Um, I can read it directly. If the first question is, how can we make a connection between improving gender equality for women at the corporate level and for the women working throughout the rest of the seafood sector? Hi. 
ペンス、えっと、日本語で失礼します。えっと、まず最初に過去の失敗や発言を恐れてはいけないということとあとは、えっと、この水産業のジャンルにとらわれず他の,あの全然違うような職業の方と一緒にこう結びつけて考えたり何かあの一緒に仕事をしてあのやることを私はすごい提案しています。So I'm suggesting first of all we should know this is a lesson I learned from my painful experiences. Listen. We must not be afraid of making mistakes in the past, action and statement. Then、uh, we should strengths encourage our career by combining, by joining together with other expertise, with other, in the other field, so that we can produce a new powerful idea to make innovations. This is what I believe. Then, And then I, I want to she w a n t to continue the story behind why she says that. えっと、というのも2019年に、えっと、SNS を中心に、えっと、ネット炎上を、あのー、したんですね自分がそれが、えっと、理由としては私がやはりあの皆さんが言っているように口答えするような女性とか反応することに対してはあまりよく思わないというやっぱ風潮が日本にもありまして私がやっぱりこう反応をしたことによって、あのー、それがあのよく思われなかったことによって過去のやっぱり些細なミスはいろいろとこう膨らんで拡散されてしまって大炎上をしてしてまったんですねであの実は先ほどあの流れたビデオはその炎上直後に撮影が入ったものだったんですねで,でもそれがすごい私にとっては応援となってあの後押しされた出来事でしたと最初にあの自分を寿司職人と認めてあの取材してくれた人たちやあとはその仲間の方たちが専門家でチームを結成してくれたりあとは自分が美大出身というのもあってアーティストの方々がすごいあの私を応援してくれて一緒にコラボしましょうって言ってくれたんですねそれがそういう違うジャンルだったことがまた新しいこう発想が生まれてすごい自分の中であのこう考えがこうすごいフレキシブルになったっていうような思い出があるのでやはりあのこういうことに関しては恐れずに前に行くこととやっぱりいろんな考え方を取り入れてあの仲間を増やしていくっていうことがすごく重要かなと思います。So I would like to explain why I say that recently, actually a year ago, I was, I was targeted on online bullying, online harassment. It was triggered by reaction because I was, as a woman in Japan, it is a culture like a norm that women should not、uh, fight back against. Males' comments or something, but they're fighting so hard. No, not fighting that I want to correct their comment on me online.、Mm. So, the, my reaction trying to correct the rumors about me or bad comment and harassment just triggered, sparked the online flood of bullying against me. And it was more like a heated up by my,、um, my small mistake on the Traditional breaking a traditional code of a male sushi, something, but very small mistakes on you know, cutting some fish in a different way, or whatever. And then it was so during on the fire online, I decided okay, we can keep filming the documentary about me. So the film that I show, the video we show, was you know, right after was during the middle of this online bullying. Harassment, sexual harassment, and also the gender harassment against me.、Um, they were attacking me so hard. However, this challenge, this adversary, gave me other positive c h a l l e n g e and opportunities. One of it, some of the good people started standing for me to support. So, one of the key p e r s o n was the one with TV director who was the first Japanese media. Like covering my story as an authentic sushi chef. So he helped me, branding me with various t y p e of experts in art or you know, different、uh, like color fashions, whatever. So even some artists, because I, my background is art school, I graduated from art college.、Um, some artists appeared to me and he said, I want to help you. How can I help you? We should do some collaboration with sushi and the art, or sushi with fashion, or whatever, sushi with kimono, whatever. So, you know, I achieve it. I achieve it. I overcome this storm of online bullying 
about gender inequality, you know, but, uh, you know, so what I learned is just, you know, you should, despite the challenge, we should, we should keep moving forward without any fear. And also we should have lots of, lots of friends to support you in a different genre and different field. This is the lesson I want to share with, with, with other uh, women who want to challenge in the fishery industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuki and Makiko as well. Um, and thank you for sharing this experience because I believe this is one of the realities of women in their everyday life, but even more so as you reach a position of leadership and maybe fame. And it's difficult because I suppose we ask you to share a painful experience, which repeats the difficulties of it. But I believe by you sharing your experience, you help um, men understand the realities for women and also women to understand they're not alone in these experiences and how we work together. So thank you again. For our next question, we turn to Charlene from InfoFish and we have a two-part question. So considering women in the sectors, uh, fisheries and aquaculture, working throughout the value chain in the context of COVID-19 crisis. What do you see have been the greatest challenges and what opportunities or potential for changes are presented in the recovery and recuperation from the child, from the crisis? So thank you, Charlene. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, uh, in terms of uh, some of the uh, issues or challenges that is being presented during the COVID-19, I think among the most uh, uh, immediate or urgent one, I would say, is the decrease, uh, the decrease in income, loss of jobs, uh, loss of independence, uh, both women and you know in general, as well as also something that um, uh, is uh, a little bit different from livelihood is the greater risk of suffering domestic abuse. Uh, simply because the, the um, lengthy um, or rather the long uh, sh shutdowns that have been uh, imposed in many of the countries or rather globally. Uh, in addition to the lowered resilience towards the impact of the pandemic. Uh, however, we have been looking at things very positively uh, as in uh, when we are being challenged, as Yuki said just now, when we, uh, when we are being challenged, we should keep pushing and we should keep looking at ways on how to um, uh, find ways to and how we can actually uh, uh, be better or, or find ways on how we, we can survive. So uh, it's it's quite obvious that the, de the demand for fish and fishery products uh, is greater during this period as consumers are actually looking, uh, continue to look for more healthier or healthy options for as food and of course, fish and seafood is one of the main uh, sources that they turn to. Uh, this means that jobs in the fisheries sectors are not that affected, although we do see effects uh, in delays in uh, getting our supplies. But uh, people still, the demand for seafood is still remains and in fact is even stronger. There has been a tremendous change in the way consumers are getting their seafood supply or rather during this period. And technology has played a very, very, very important role and continues to do so. The trend is going to be such for the time being. Uh, you know, online sales has boomed, deliveries have boomed, and people are using more and more apps to, to uh, uh, make their sales. Uh, the people behind these deliveries include women. Uh, a big number include women who are doing small businesses. Uh, whether they're owners of the of the business, whether they're workers, the delivery people, women play a very important role. And it's likely, as I said, this trend is, is going to stay for a while. People are quite uh, comfortable with having uh, these deliveries to their homes because it's safer. So it's a very potential uh, uh, avenue that women should look into and in how they can develop especially those who have lost their jobs, those who have uh, or pl planning to start a new job or looking for other means of income. This is a very um, a potential way how they can 
look for opportunities to uh, as a source of li livelihood. Um, the investment is pretty low, and uh, people are you 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 actually have almost equal opportunities as as um, your male allies, simply because nobody is checking on whether the business is owned by a lady or a, or a man. So we have equal opportunities and you know, people are, are looking for opportunities to, to sell their product to all kinds of means. So I think this is a very important uh, opportunity and a very, um, something that has to be, or rather people should push, women should really look at this opportunity on how they can uh, explore. Um, we all know the, the powerful uh, or the potential of social media as a tool to spread information. Uh, in fact, it's been said that 51% of the global population is using social media today. That's, that's, that's a very big, big number. And uh, people are scrolling screens every day. We are almost, if we were doing that 20% before, now with COVID, we are, I think, 50% or 70% on the on the on the phone or screen or you know any device uh, and of course uh, food including fish and seafood uh, is being uh, sold through this internet um, in asia there's been a tremendous number of ways people are using to get the fish to the consumer uh, through social media whatsapp facebook auction everything uh, you know it's amazing how creative, they come up with ideas on how to sell seafood. And again, women form a very important part in this and trying to sell. So it's a good avenue to start and I think a very important opportunity at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shirlene, for your response. And yeah, this is a really interesting point that you make that um, there's some, with, the, with things being sold digitally, there's some protection for this decision that might be made between women and men backed businesses. So this is an interesting point you raised. Thank you. We move to our third question now. And this question actually comes to us courtesy of Meryl Williams from the Gender and Aquafish Network and is inspired by a quote from Audre Lorde in Age, Race, Class and Sex, Women Redefining Difference from Sister Outsider. And so, Ricardo, I'll ask you to move to this question on the PowerPoint. Thank you. Um, the question is, a lot of research and action to support women in the fisheries and aquaculture sector is done by women. And this is a continuation of the point made in, in the reference I just mentioned, that in other words, it is the responsibility of the oppressed to teach the oppressors their mistakes. So I ask this question to our colleagues from WSI, Crystal and Marie-Christine. What role do you see for male allies and what is your call to action for these male allies? Thank you very much, Jennifer, for this question. I love this question because we, we can think that um, gender and, and, and place of woman in, in seafood is a, is a problem of, of women or is a, yes, it's a woman topic. And I say, no, it's first, it's a male topic because they are most in decision uh, making a role. So, and I, I can understand personally that it's, it's not easy for them to get the situation, to get a sense of discrimination that women are suffering and so on. So I understand, but at some point, uh, there are leaders, they are in position of power, they are smart, they can, they can lead with a bit of empathy and understand that there is, yes, there is a situation and this situation is a problem for all of us. My call to action is very simple, and I think it's it's a list of action that you can see nowadays in and today, especially in all the social media. It's a list of things that each man can do towards one or several women around him. He can listen to her or to them. He can coach, promote, advocate, and encourage. Only that, it's simply powerful. And it's already a massive action and a massive impact and change for both men and women. Thank you. Thank you, Christelle. I will give 
um, not another version, but uh, my opinion on this very powerful quote from Audre Lorde. Um, she also said that when you are a woman, you are afraid to speak or to not be heard. And when you are silent, you are afraid to. So um, let us speak. And thank you to FAO to give us this, the chance to speak now on, on this subject, which is dear to our heart because um, um, now in echo to what Christelle just said, uh, I would say that men don't see the privilege they have or they don't want to see it or end. Certainly they don't want to lose this privilege. So what can we do? Um, back to the seafood industry, um, I have a suggestion. Um, I would like the FAO to organize an international conferences on that particular subject and target it to men with male speakers. And you can have 100 male speakers. It won't be a problem for me for this time. I will not count really, but invite male to discuss this subject because uh, uh, we need all together to understand the issue. We need to share the diagnosis, which is not yet shared perfectly be between the two genders. And, uh, and we have the feeling that male need to be educated on these issues. And without this education, we will miss the point. We will miss the subject. So to make it short, could FAO organize such an international conference at high level, inviting men preferably? Thank you. Thank you, Marie-Christine and Christelle for your points. And Marie-Christine for your call to action. Um, I certainly think this is something we should like to take up, but we know that this is something that needs to be discussed. So I say thank you so much <laughs> for the call to action. <laughs> I and guess. I hope we can answer that enthusiastically very soon. Um, as we leave behind these round of questions, we move to a form of a, um, a soundbite round, I suppose where I would like to ask each of the panelists to provide a takeaway message they'd like everybody to recall as they think back to the webinar today. So I would invite um, Charlene to begin and then we can go from there to Yuki, Christelle and we'll end again with Marie-Christine. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Message. Hi. Message. Okay, this. But I see Sorry, I just need to clarify. I've made a small mess. Um, we'll ask Shirlene to begin and then okay. Yuki next. Okay, so. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, well, um, I, I've got a very simple one and uh, it's based on this quote by Mahatma Gandhi, be the change you want to see. Uh, and I believe this very strongly in and also make the change and lead the way. Uh, every step counts, even if it's the smallest step, every step counts. And I think we should uh, not, uh, nothing should stop us from uh, being the first to change or not. Let's, um, whatever or whichever group that we are representing, let's be the first to change or not, even if it's the smallest change. Thank you. Thank you. Yuki, please go ahead. えっと、私がいつもここどに止めている言葉があります。なので、えっと、恐れることなく明日になったらやっぱり新しい世界を夢見て頑張っていくことだと私は思っています。There's one word that I I eat every day as a as a like vitamins, as a nourishment. It say uh today's how to say um out of common sense, in common sense. 
it's a revolution, should be a revolution in the future, tomorrow. So, you know, every time I get lost, where should I go? Should I do it right or not? It's, a, it's out of common sense, but if you keep, if I keep believing what I feel, and then I pave away, so it's happened. Now we see the change in the fishery industry today. So I, you know, what I want to tell as a message, um, believe in yourself without any fears, and then um, the, you you grab the new world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Crystal. I would I would ask a question instead of a message. As as uh, in 2020, humanity entered a new in a kind of new era where we we feel the our vulnerability, our volatile. We are in a VK world now. It's it's all aware. I would ask you, okay, what kind of leadership do we want today? Thank you. Mary Christine, I would say count, count. Uh, oh no, sorry, I said that earlier. But you remember, we have to count every day in every meeting we enter or every kind con conference we assist to. We should count, but no, really. Um, my last message would be to all leaders: be aware of gender inequality before any decision you take and make sure that your decision differs from the ones you have taken in the past. We are now in the 21st century and decisions should take that into account and, and certainly not be copy of decision you as a leader have taken in the past century. So uh, progress with your time and take women and gender um, inequalities or um, chances or opportunity opportunities into account before you take any decision. That would be my message. Thank you so much, Marie Christine. I um, really appreciate all of the contributions from the panelists today. And um, we, we hope by giving a bit of space for you to discuss and present, to share real experiences, um, we're able to increase the understanding of the colleagues and participants who work, I think, throughout the seafood sector in different areas, also in research, academia, and for the UN bodies. Um, we have a long ways to go in this work, and we luckily have a strong advocate who is going to be closing for us today. Um, this is the Deputy Director of the Fisheries Division, Arden Lem, and he also is my supervisor. And so I would invite him to share his words with us now. Thank you, Jennifer, and hello to everyone. Uh, distinguished panelists, colleagues, participants, and friends. This roundtable discussion on women's leadership in fisheries and agriculture has certainly been stimulating, interesting, and with great interventions and perspectives. We've had the opportunity to learn about the experiences of Chef Yuki Kyuri as she cuts through the male-dominated sushi industry, becoming an example and role model, not only for women in Japan, but for female chefs all over the world. We've heard from Charlene as the head of Info Fish, and also the perspectives and their success uh, by Marie-Christine and Christelle in their individual ways to leadership and their studies that they've conducted as part of the work of their organization. I would also like to thank my colleague, Maria Elena Semedo, for her inspiring example and leadership also in this field. We know that whenever we discuss women and leadership, we are touching on a topic that needs much support and advancement. Today's roundtable discussion has called on leaders from the fisheries and agriculture sector, a sector that remains very much a work in progress when it comes to gender equality and equal opportunities for women and men. Indeed, 
One of the problems we face is the very perception of gender as a domain only of study and not an issue of implementation or equity or opportunity. In fact, when we look more closely on the fisheries and aquaculture sector, we sometimes register even some tension between technologists and experts on one hand, and on the other hand, the social and gender specialists. But in reality, we need to acknowledge the complementarity of these areas and the need and relevance of both disciplines or all disciplines. There is much work to be done, but this is not work to be done by women alone. Men have a crucial role in the movement towards gender equality, and in fact, a responsibility to take on this work as allies. In this respect, let me quote the He for She movement, initiated by the United Nations, which states, an ally can be someone who amplifies women's voices, who educates themselves about different identities and experiences, someone who challenges the status quo, and someone who takes action. Gender equality is critical to all, women and men, boys and girls. Rethinking the power relationship between human beings and traditional gender roles will release us from old and restrictive norms that limit men, women, as well as those who define their identity otherwise. With the COVID-19 pandemic, this has become even more urgent. The pandemic has turned out to be a carrier and revealer of inequalities as it has severely impacted global seafood value chains. And the impact of the crisis has been borne particularly by women. They have been losing income and leaving the make labor market at a far greater rate while taking on, at the same time, a larger burn, burden of care and domestic work. The crisis has been shown to worsen existing inequalities, and we are now at risk of losing decades of progress for gender equality. This crystallizes our need for immediate action by incorporating a gender lens in all our work. Indeed, without a gender focus, we will not capture the reality of women and men in the sector, nor will we achieve the goal of sustainable and equitable fisheries and aquaculture while ignoring the loss of opportunities for women and the sector itself. This clear message is also reflected in the outcomes of the 2019 International Symposium on Fisheries Sustainability. It is also a principle well addressed in the FAO Fisheries Small Scale uh, Guidelines. Therefore, the Fisheries Division of FAO is committed to mainstream gender in all its activities to enable the fisheries and agriculture sector to reach its full potential. Before I close, I would like to take this opportunity to announce a forthcoming technical webinar on experiences in implementing gender transformative approaches in the fisheries and agriculture sector for food security and nutrition. This will take place on March 16 and is organized in the framework of the European Union funded Rome based agencies joint program on gender transformative approaches for food security and nutrition. This is one of the many steps that our division in FAO is taking together with our colleagues towards gender equality and the transformation of the sector towards full sustainability in all its three dimensions. We thank our colleagues from the Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equity Division for involving us in this upcoming event and for their general support in gender mainstreaming in our fisheries division. Finally, I would like to thank each and one of you for your participation in this special webinar as we mark the occasion of the International Women's Day in 2021. Thank you. The seminar is hereby closed.